Hello. Uh, welcome to the second flood warning uh, public meeting. This is a progress since our first public meeting, which was held on the 23rd of March this year. And uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to this uh, exciting uh, project that we're doing in stormwater management to enhance our flood warning capabilities citywide. So my name is Ranjan S. Mutaya. I'm a senior professional engineer with Stormwater Division, Transportation Public Works. And uh, you all can see my email down there. It's uh, my first name, dot uh, last name at fortworthtexas.gov. And if you have any questions related to this uh, project, please feel free to email me. So I'd like to acknowledge the uh, funders for this project. Uh, this is a, uh, a matched project. Uh, the uh, matches are being uh, cost shared by the city and the Texas Water Development Board. And the Water Development Board is using the flood protection grant uh, that the governor uh, created in 2016 to uh, fund these types of projects. So. Uh, we appreciate the support provided by the uh, Texas Water Development Board. And we also acknowledge the uh, 60th anniversary uh, of the formation of the uh, Water Development Board. They've been doing great work uh, since their formation to help with the water resources, the water supply uh, problems that the state encounters. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the contributions made by several uh, agencies to make this uh, project a reality. Um, there are departments within the city, the um, Office of Emergency Management, the uh, Stormwater Transportation Department. There are several people that have contributed towards uh, where we are right now. And externally, the National Weather Service has uh, provided uh, feedback uh, and other agencies such as the USGS. Uh, the neighboring cities uh, have uh, also contributed uh, towards uh, hosting uh, weather stations that we'll talk about here in a little while. So I want to acknowledge some of the neighboring cities that have uh, contributed towards our efforts. But I also want to thank you. Thank you for uh, staying engaged and involved and providing feedback. So the purpose of the grant is to develop a citywide flood warning system that is reliable and relevant. We'll be using uh, the existing network that we have. It's called the high water warning system. We'll make enhancements to that and the uh, focus on flood warning is to collect the data that's being co uh, collected at uh, weather stations, at high water warning sites that monitor the water levels, and provide that to the public and emergency responders. And the third and final uh, purpose of the grant is to develop a flood response plan that uh, identifies the major threats and the response to the flood threats that the uh, city potentially faces. The grant is, as I mentioned earlier, cost share. Um, and uh, the city is uh, providing uh, the match in terms of procurement of the software, consulting services, and uh, through in-kind uh, travel match, as well as in-kind staff time. The, uh, the Water Development Board portion of this grant is being used to procure equipment uh, for this grant project. So um, 
I'll go through the schedule uh, in just a little while, but we've also requested a nine-month extension for this grant. It was uh, ambitiously uh, aimed at about a one-year project. We believe that uh, we need an, another nine months uh, to comfortably complete this project. So here's what I had shown earlier. The first public meeting, you all had attended the March meeting. Uh, we were scheduled to have a uh, meeting in June, July, if everything was crunched down to one year. But as of now, we believe that uh, we need a nine-month extension. So here we are in October, November. We've ha we have had a second public meeting. And uh, we have uh, made good progress on the software. We got uh, about halfway through on the equipment installation process, and we are about um, 60 to 60 to 70 percent of the way there on the flood response plan. So, what's the new schedule going to look like? We anticipate finishing the installation of gauges around May June time frame of 2018. We'll begin the installation of that equipment, uh, which will consist of weather gauges and the telemetry around January, February. The software itself has uh, gone through a procurement process. We are in the process of uh, writing a contract, uh, or inking the contract. We have uh, negotiated the contract. We just need to get approval from the council for the software contract. And then um, that implementation will run through um, May, June time frame. The flood response plan, as I mentioned, is um, also has made relatively good progress. We got uh, to uh, refine the flood response plan developed to date, and then we'll run it through a tabletop exercise, receive public comment, receive external agency comments, and then we'll uh, revise that uh, flood response plan subject to the lessons learned, and then it'll be submitted to the Water Development Board. The grantor, the uh, Water Development Board, requires a final report on this project, and we will generate that during the uh, end of the project period. We anticipate hold, holding our second public meeting once all these three main components of the project are complete. So here's our existing system that we plan on enhancing to create this flood warning uh, system. Uh, the high water warning system is based off of uh, alerting roadside drivers to high water on the uh, streets uh, at 52 uh, hazardous low water crossing sites. And the uh, data that's generated uh, through the alarms when the roads get overtopped is uh, submitted to... Um, the uh, first responders. So these are real-time alarms that take place in real time as the wa wa water starts overtopping the streets. What you see on the map are the different uh, phases that the uh, high water warning system went through over the years. It began around 2006 and then got enhanced um, subsequent to that to the 52 uh, current sites that are being monitored. The data itself is collected in these field sites and then transmitted to a receive station at uh, Bernard Plaza. So here's a little bit more detail of that. The uh, water levels are measured by pressure transducers. And then the data that's collected again in real time is transmitted from the field sites to the receive station uh, at Bernard Plaza. My mouse uh, is uh, circling the, the, the internals of what that receive station looks like. So data comes into an antenna at the top of Bernard Plaza, and then uh, 
in the building, there is a um, receive uh, station that consists of uh, receiver decoders that uh, convert the data after it's gone through some uh, radio frequency filtering through these cavity filters that get uh, then uh, decoded to, uh, to data that's sent to a server, a flood warning uh, uh, software that's hosted on the server, processes the data, which then gets um, cleaned up and is used to generate alarms as well as uh, used to generate display of the data. I do want to talk about the rain gauge uh, system. Uh, at these low water crossings, there are uh, rain gauges. Um, there are about there are 39 uh, rain gauges spread out throughout the city as part of this network. Eight of those uh, rain gauges are on dedicated weather stations that measure not only rainfall but other things like uh, air temperature, barometric pressure, humidity. So the protocol that's used to communicate from the field uh, is called ALERT. This is a 1970s-based technology that transmits whenever there is a, a trigger, like if a tipping bucket tips over in those rain gauges, that creates a trigger that's sent out from the field to the receive station at Bernard Plaza. So... Uh, all sites that collect data report whenever there is a trigger uh, event. Uh, either the pressure transducers uh, are measuring water levels and that water levels get uh, transmitted in real time or the tipping buckets measure uh, in real time, as well as other data that's collected on the, uh, on the uh, the sensors or the batteries that uh, power the system, the solar panels. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, data that's collected and sent from the field sites. Uh, of course, not in, uh, the, the, on real time like the rainfall and the water levels, but they are transmitted. There are close to, uh, totally across the system, there are close to seven to 800 different types of uh, sensor data that's generated, uh, which includes the batteries, the solar panels, uh, and things like that, in addition to the, the sensors that measure the water level and the weather. This alert protocol has no error correction. So whatever data is collected is transmitted. There is no uh, a, uh, a receiver to uh, transmit a um, correction protocol employed to check whether the data is valid or not that's transmitted. And then during uh, high rainfall events, uh, as you can imagine, these um, tipping buckets and water level sensors uh, get very busy and there's a high level of traffic, radio traffic generated uh, when there's a rainfall event. And uh, if you were to try to expand this network, your data loss gets even worse. Um, the good thing is uh, this technology uh, is outdated and there's more recent communication protocol. However, there is a, um, it's a little bit of a, um, a, uh, a compromise in terms of what you gain um, in terms of the security of the data transmission. And that is that the alert transmits very quickly. Whenever there's an event, it transmits. Uh, to the relay station or the receive station in Bernard Plaza. And that transmission time might be uh, in the millisecond range. Uh, however, you do have this problem of the data collision. The, uh, uh, the server that's, um, that's receiving the data uh, can only uh, deal with uh, one transmission at a time, even though it's within that uh, millisecond range. But if you have lots of transmission that just collide with each other, that becomes a big problem. So that, that's um, one of the limitations of this alert system is the data collision is, is the biggest issue. Um, so what does a flood warning system look like compared to this high water warning system? 
we will uh, continue to use the uh, high water warning system with its uh, field sensors, uh, which is mainly geared towards alerting the roadside drivers of uh, flood floods at um, these low water crossing sites. So that will continue to run. But we'll be enhancing that system with additional uh, rain gauges. Uh, we'll be improving the telemetry. We'll be uh, improving the software. So the the experience that the public gets from this improvements will be significantly more uh, than uh, than what's currently available, and the uh, the data processing and things like that also will get enhanced through um, use of uh, the Alert Two uh, communication protocol. So here's the Alert Two uh, communication protocol. Uh, it's a uh, upgrade to the older alert protocol. It uh, is designed for uh, higher uh, transmission rates, um, and it uses GPS um, clock technology to keep keep up with the transmission um, and the receive uh, time. So you, you don't get the data loss because um, you got a time slot associated with. Uh, with the transmission, there is uh, error correction in the protocol. So there is uh, the, the 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 transmission structure, the the bit data that gets transmitted has error correction uh, codes built into it, so that the um, the receiver can validate the data as it's being received. And the uh, receive uh, that actually the transmit message can be variable length instead of a fixed length as it is in alert. Uh, now uh, there is, as I mentioned, a compromise, and that is that the alert two, because it does a lot of error correction uh, and and uh, uses. Um, the uh, error correction methods, uh, it, it does have a latency period of about one to one minute or so from the time that the data is collected. Uh, and then the, um, the alert two uh, protocol is what they use in the, uh, in the system that's uh, out there in Harris County. And during Hurricane Harvey, it performed really well. Not uh, much data loss. If, if there was any data loss, it was very minimal. So as we transition from the, the current alert to the alert two protocol, uh, we'll be doing it in phases instead of uh, pulling the switch immediately. The new weather stations that are being installed as part of the Water Development Board grant effort will be placed on Alert 2. And there'll be Alert 2 um, equipment at the received site at Burner Plaza, uh, as well as we'll have a second uh, received site at the Bridge Street uh, Tower. So we'll have two received sites just in case Burner Plaza goes down for whatever reason. And uh, the uh, new alert two will be put on a third frequency. The, the, we currently have four frequencies that we use. Uh, two of those are actively used for alert. The remaining two, one of those two remaining two will be used for the alert two. And then over the years, um, over the coming years, as we get more experience with alert two, the uh, alert protocol will get decommissioned and then all the transmission sites, the current high water warning system transmission sites will be put on alert too. There will be some additional modifications made. Uh, currently, all the uh, sensor sites uh, transmit, uh, have radios and they transmit to Bernard Plaza. Uh, so that creates a lot of uh, the communication overload during an event. We want to mini try to minimize that. And uh, we're going to do that by uh, having the master controllers that are located at these remote sites 
be the only ones communicating to Bernard Plaza, and then the localized communication between the, um, the field sensors will be handled by the master controller units. So I want to uh, step back a little bit at this point and provide, uh, and I apologize as I move the mouse uh, back and forth, I'm trying to make sure that you all can see this uh, clearly. Okay, let me see if I can maximize this so I don't have to do that. Yeah, I don't have to do it. Um, so the um, the idea with this uh, with the citywide is that uh, we are going to be locating um, a various number of rain gauges. We think about twenty uh, different uh, new sites. We have about. Uh, 39, uh, let's go round that up to 40. So it's the, we're talking about whole numbers. So total, we'll have about 60 rain gauges spread out throughout the city. Uh, some of them actually will be located outside the city limits. We are, we are collaborating with neighboring cities to, to, for them to host some of these rain gauge sites. So we have a good distribution of rain gauges. But that by itself is not going to provide uh, a lot of information citywide. The city of is about three. The city of Fort Worth is 350 square miles, and uh, obviously that's a large area. So the the current density um, is about one gauge to about 10 square miles, uh, which is not too bad, really. Uh, but that if, when you're dealing with real time, uh, you, you do want to try to capture as much of that spatial variability as possible. So we 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 are planning on tying in as 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 uh, it's, it's right now. So this is not nothing new. As it's right now, we are planning on. Um, uh, using a hybrid approach by tying into the uh, NEXTRAD radar measurements that are made by the National Weather Service. So the Weather Service does do this already. It's just that we'll have more rain gauges uh, on the ground to uh, help enhance that uh, process uh, and uh, try to minimize the uh, problems associated with predicting rainfall from the NEXTRAD uh, radar system. So the current uh, NEXTRAD radar system uh, has been updated to uh, transmit in what's called dual polarization. So I, I'm, I'm highlighting a little antenna in the lower right corner here to show you the transmission, the cartoon transmission of a, of a um, radar wave uh, in the uh, expand, and uh, the National Weather Service has enhanced those radars to transmit in two different uh, polarization states or different directions. One in the uh, horizontal direction, and then another wave in the vertical direction. So, these two different types of polarization let you. Uh, better characterize the type of uh, rainfall or the types of uh, cloud characteristics. The, the cloud, as you can imagine, uh, consists of all three different phases of uh, water. It's in liquid form, it's in solid form, in crystals, ice crystals, as well as it's in the um, vapor form, uh, mainly below the clouds. And so we get to experience the liquid form as it falls down, as it uh, precipitates out of these clouds. And so these radar systems have to be sophisticated uh, not to go too high, uh, so you don't hit the those crystal layers, as well as not go uh, too low. So that that's where the tricky part is. Anyway, over the years, uh, the, the National Weather Service has gotten good about um, characterizing the, 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 the rainfall using the, uh, the radar system and uh, the more recent radar systems since 2013, 2014 time frame uh, have these dual polarization capabilities, which is, uh, has provided uh, enhancement in terms of characterizing the rainfall and other severe events. 
So the main point I want to make here is that while we will enhance the uh, the network of uh, weather stations and rain gauging in Fort Worth, we will uh, tie in to the radar system to provide a more comprehensive view uh, citywide. Now, th th that doesn't mean that we won't be uh, using the radar-only system uh, as and when needed. So here's that uh, next rad system I was talking to you about. Uh, this is what uh, this is one of the systems you see on TV uh, weather stations. The picture on the uh, Upper right corner shows the uh, radar station at the Sphinx Airport. And on the bottom, I've shown you the signatures that were being picked up during Hurricane Harvey. So it's actively used not only by the weather station, but uh, by a variety of other folk that uh, provide the weather service information. Another system um, that uh, is located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is this CASA radar system. And uh, whereas the uh, NEXTRAD National Weather Service uh, radar system uh, sweeps across a much uh, larger um, swath of the sky, the uh, CASA radar system focuses on the lower elevations. So it doesn't have to scan uh, as much, and the return um, period on these uh, CASA radar systems are a lot faster in the minute range, whereas the national, uh, the NEXTRAD system um, uh, takes about five minutes, um, could take about five minutes. Uh, I have shown you the circles that are these different radars that are located in the uh, CASA radar. So each one of these circle it has is a transmission radius from one of these uh, radar sites, and there are eight of these uh, radar systems. Uh, and the the more the overlap, so areas where you see a lot of overlap, you're going to have a lot more uh, confidence in the measurements than areas that have no overlap. As you can see, uh, out in the south as well as the uh, southwest as well as in the northerly direction. And on the right side, I have showed you um, uh, a event from... Uh, January, um, which had uh, severe tornadic events, uh, and you can see all the, the red, that's the high-intensity rainfall events. Actually, the white spots that you see there are areas where the uh, tornado that had wrapped uh, around it a lot of rainfall touched ground. So, so the, this, this radar system uh, provides quite a bit of um, not only... Um, uh, rainfall information, but also wind information that uh, enhances the um, the um, forecast capabilities that can be used to warn people about the extreme events. So we are fortunate uh, that we live in an area that's covered by these two different uh, radar systems. We'll um, work with the National Weather Service on the next rad, uh, and then we will work with the CASA team um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, at this point, uh, I forgot to acknowledge the CASA team when I uh, th gave you my thank yous, but uh, the CASA team, uh, which is based uh, out of, uh, off of research teams at the University of Massachusetts, University of Colorado, and UT Arlington. Um, so for our part, uh, we are looking at trying to generate um, thresholds that could be used to program the, uh, the radar systems to provide warning. And one way we are doing that is to look at um, the uh, high water warning sites, these 52 high water warning sites, which have been gauged for water levels, which have been gauged for rainfall, 
and look at trends in the in the water levels and look at trends in the rainfall to see whether there are patterns that we can pick out that could be programmed into the uh, the ra radar measurements uh, that are being monitored in real time. So what I've shown here is a graph of that, uh, and uh, let me spend just a little bit of time going through this. So the dotted lines uh, in blue, uh, or the dotted uh, icons in blue, is the water level measured at a low water crossing site. In this case, it happens to be at the 28th Street and Lebeau Creek, which is uh, a flashy uh, creek in, in, in the city. And uh, this was an event uh, from um, um, late November in 2015. And uh, you can see there were two uh, overtopping events. Uh, anything over zero means it overtopped. And uh, on uh, the, the time frame between uh, 26th and 27th, there was an overtime, uh, overtopping, and then immediately after the 27th mid midnight, there was another overtopping. Uh, and that tends to be a lot more dangerous because it's in the dark and people can't see. Uh, so there were two of these events. Uh, and then the red dots show the uh, accumulated rainfall. So what, what we mean by accumulated means that this is a running tab. It's a total sum of the rainfall as it's being measured. It's not the individual measurements uh, with time, but the individual measurements that are summed up over time. And that's why you see an increase of the rainfall. And uh, what you want to notice is that uh, the steepness of that cumulative uh, rainfall tends to steepen up as we experience these uh, flood events on the ground. So uh, that's one way uh, that we are using um, the, the, uh, these measurements to inform the, the radar system. And currently, we are working with the CASA team uh, to look at these, to look at 15 minute increments and as the, uh, of rainfall and as the uh, the intensity uh, within those 15-minute increments uh, start peaking up. Uh, we've uh, identified two watersheds uh, below those um, CASA radar footprints to issue um, alarms. And that's still in, in uh, development, but as we um, uh, learn more and test it out, um, we'll be in a state uh, to make that uh, more publicly available. I just wanted to give you an example of the way we are using uh, the ground measurements to help inform the forecast. So uh, this question came up um, at the first public meeting, and that is that um, um, that we are going to be using the rainfall measurements uh, from both the ground uh, measurements as well as from radar in, in either uh, from the radar form or in a hybrid form to make the, uh, the lead uh, flood warning. Um, we are not at this stage going to take that rainfall, ingest it into complex numerical uh, hydrologic models and run those hydrologic models to make forecasts. We're going to rely on making those warnings off of the rainfall at this time. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I hope you uh, have a good understanding of what we're trying to do. And uh, from here on out, I'm going to be talking about uh, what we have done to date on this project. So we've... Uh, created a, a website for you all to access, and the website is uh, www.fortworthtexas.gov forward slash flood warning. We'll be placing updates. This public meeting, as well as the previous public meeting, uh, is uh, recorded and posted on there. Uh, we have um, executed contract uh, with a consultant uh, firm called DDI, to help us uh, with uh, our project. 
Uh, we have uh, resolved some of the data conflict problems that we were experiencing with our current high water warning system at the receive site by squelching the noise at the transceiver si uh, site. And then we have uh, done some uh, preliminary engineering, structural engineering analysis at the second receive site uh, at the Bridge Street Tower. So the second receive site is uh, going to be a failover system in case the, the primary receive site at Burnett Plaza um, uh, fails. And we have identified issues that need to be resolved to make the uh, high water warning system a little bit more reliable in terms of the water level measurements as well as the weather gauging. And we have uh, developed a strategy to locate the weather stations uh, in and around Fort, Fort Worth. We have uh, selected a software, uh, and we have a uh, draft of the flood response plan um, in place that's being refined. So here's a picture of that Bridge Street Tower. This is the second received site. It's uh, about 250 feet tall, and our uh, receive antenna will be located at the top, and a cable, a coax cable, will run from that Bridge Street Tower to a uh, building close by that will um, have the uh, tr transceiver and the digiport um, boxes that will take the data and transmit it to the server, pretty much like I had showed you earlier for Bernard Plaza. So our strategy for locating the weather stations is to fill in the regional gaps. Uh, if you look at the region, and I think the next map shows that region, so let me bring that up. No, it's not. So I'll, uh, it's further down on the slide deck, and, and uh, um, you'll see what I mean by this. But the, the region in the south, uh, southwest, and the westerly regions uh, have missing gaps in them. And... Uh, those gaps will uh, fill, so we have um, more weather data farther out, and lots of the frontal systems come that way. So it's totally justified to locate weather stations out that way, that side. Uh, the telemetry itself, we can reach out to 30 miles. Um, and then within flood-prone watersheds, we'll locate the uh, gauges uh, in the upper one third of the watershed. The site selection themselves have to go through a vetting process. We need uh, permissions from the landowner. The site has to be secure. Uh, there needs to be some, some fencing around, not, not necessarily around the weather, weather station itself, but close by, so it serves as a deterrence. And uh, the site needs uh, good access so we can go and regularly maintain it. Uh, there needs to be uh, a, uh, a clearance, a 45-degree clearance above uh, the weather station so there is no obstruction that will prevent the, the rainfall measurements and other weather parametric uh, measurements. And uh, we plan on locating the rain gauge uh, at all about uh, 10 feet, not more than that. Here is the radio path analysis that uh, told us how far out we can go. So anything that's colored uh, in blue all the way to red. So red means great reception. Blue is lower reception uh, potential, but we can still receive it, um, receive the data. Um, and um, we can go out actually all the way to Granbury uh, if needed. Uh, the actual expansion plan is going to um, go out to through to about uh, Croissant, Godly, God, and Joshua. So these are the cities we are talking to right now: Joshua, Godly, Croissant, and uh, Weatherford, uh, and then also Mansfield out here to locate the gauges out in this direction. So this is the Bernard Plaza uh, strength of reception. And here's the strength of reception from uh, Bridge Street. Not as strong, 
Uh, but that's not a big concern uh, because we don't expect this bridge street to be down uh, or be actively used for for an extended period of time. It's just serving as a backup, just in case uh, the uh, transmission to uh, Bernard Plaza fails. Um, so we feel comfortable comfortable with uh, the bridge street tower uh, reception. Um, and I, I let me add that. In this picture, what you see as uh, those inverted triangles are the existing rain gauge and weather station sites. So we're going to significantly expand the footprint uh, out uh, west, uh, southwest uh, from, uh, from where we are right now. Here's what the proposed weather station is going to look like. Uh, the components will be uh, a multi-sensor that measures all these different types of parameters, including rainfall. We'll have a supplementary uh, tipping bucket rain gauge at some of these sites to validate the distrometer that's located in the uh, multi-sensor uh, unit. Um, the, the transmission box will consist of the alert two controller units and uh, the the concrete pad and pole uh, is not going to exceed more than more than ten feet. Here's uh, <clears throat> the distribution of rain gauges uh, and weather stations in the metroplex uh, as they relate to where we are. In the green lines are the uh, major watersheds that drain the um, drain the city of Fort Worth, and as you can see, uh, areas in the the south southwest uh, there isn't a lot of areas that are gauged, and so that needs to be filled in um, so we can capture the rainfall patterns that are coming out from that direction. We have access to uh, nearly all the other weather stations that are shown on there from our partners uh, uh, out uh, east and from other, other directions. I wanted to go through, uh, okay. Let me see whether I can get that. Okay, bring that picture down so you can see it. Um, I want to go through the strategy for locating um, gauges in watersheds. Uh, we are not going to have uh, a lot of lead time because the um, the floods when they hit a watershed uh, can impact. Uh, the outlet of the watershed within about 20, not within about a, on, on average, within about a 20 minute period. So you don't have a lot of time. And locating uh, the rain gauge uh, on the low end of the watershed as it is right now with the high water warning system provides very limited lead time. So we want to try to go out to the edges of the watershed as much as possible. And uh, And that's what we plan on doing so. The um, plan is to locate these weather stations close to the uh, edges of the watershed divides, so that uh, if and when these rain gauges by themselves uh, get used to provide that uh, lead um, forecast to some of these more flood-prone watersheds. Um, there will be, on average, about a 20-minute lead time. Uh, I do need to mention that the uh, National Weather Service, the, the, the next rad based predictions can go out to about an hour. The numerical models that they use uh, and provide the quantitative, what's called the QPEs, can go out to like 18 hours, but that's uh, using numerical models. Uh, and those uh, radar signatures can 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 get used uh, in more sophisticated models to provide, uh, of course, less lead time. Uh, the CASA radar uh, also runs uh, atmospheric models based off of the radar footprints, and those can go out to about 15 minutes. 
um, the, the the CASA radar footprints like hundred meters, so the, it's it's very much more precise than the next red. Next red um, footprints about a one by one mile by one mile um, area. So uh, the idea here with this uh, with locating these gauges as well as with the, with the radar system uh, is is try to provide as much lead time as possible. And the more we can ground correct those radar signatures and more we can locate these gauges at strategically located positions, the more lead time um, we'd have. So the, the timing is, is everything in these uh, flashy uh, flood, flood environments. So uh, the remaining tasks on the gauging uh, that'll get us through this contract period is to finish uh, installation of the receive equipment at the Bridge Street. Uh, we have done the structural analysis uh, to locate the equipment on a, a tower like that. You've got to go through a structural analysis. Others, they won't let you put anything on that. So that's been complete, and now we are in the process of procuring the equipment through bids uh, to locate uh, the uh, receive equipment. We are working with neighboring cities uh, to develop interlocal agreements. Um, and I just received one today from uh, Joshua. So thanks to the city of Joshua um, for working with us uh, on locating a gauge um, on, in your city, uh, as well as we are working with, uh, with the other neighboring cities I mentioned earlier. So we expect uh, all of that, the, the placement of the receive equipment, the interlocals, and the bids to be done by end of this year. And then uh, early part of next year, we'll go through the bids, select the contractors, and then we'll be able to start installing soon after, um, sometime in the January, um, February timeframe. And then those installations will um, take us through about June timeframe. So by the end of June, we hope to have all the gauging equipment in place, um, and those will all be on alert too. I want to move on to uh, the flood warning software. So uh, we've made significant progress on the software since our last public meeting. Um, we had issued uh, bids. Uh, we reviewed the proposals. The um, vendors provided demonstrations. We selected uh, a uh, software system. We began contract negotiations with the software vendor, and uh, we are in the process of approving the um, the contract through uh, mayor and council approval process. So we have gone through the selection and recommendation stages. And we've uh, selected and we recommend uh, the Contrail software from One Rain Incorporated. I want to just talk a little bit about the software system itself. The software is flexible enough to be hosted on a uh, desktop um, environment as well as uh, mobile units um, that uh, you can carry on your cell phones. Uh, it. Uh, has data collection capabilities uh, across a variety of uh, meteorological variables. It can ingest both the alert and alert two protocols, so uh, we'll be able to keep up with what's going on in the high water warning system as well as the new enhanced system consisting of the dedicated weather stations. It processes the raw data that's collected uh, by the transceiver uh, unit, and then it uh, does a lot of QAQC checking so that you don't provide corrupted data uh, to the emergency responders or the public. Uh, there's a lot of good visualization capabilities. It's got an alarm manager to send out those uh, texts and real-time alarms to, uh, to uh, the, the emergency responders. And um, it can also uh, be used to uh, activate um, uh, the, those flasher units. Uh, now, I need to, do need to mention that those flasher units that, uh, that, are, that you see out on those uh, 52 low water crossing signs, uh, sites, 
uh, they get triggered automatically. So it doesn't wait for the software at the central receive station on Bernard Plaza to, to tell it what to do. Whenever the high water warning, uh, high water um, is triggered, uh, it responds uh, immediately to that uh, trigger event locally. Uh, that's the way it's currently uh, right now, and we don't plan on changing that. Uh, and it's uh, the Contrail software also has good reporting capabilities. Here's uh, a couple of uh, screenshots uh, from the Hurricane Harvey experience. Uh, so this is what some of the folk that were monitoring Hurricane Harvey uh, at, um, at Harris County were seeing on their system. Uh, and uh, we can highlight a, a, like a table format and show you where some of the intense events are taking place. In this case, the, those reds are very high events uh, that have uh, exceeded um, historical standards. Um, and in this case, it's actually exceeded the 500-year events. Uh, you can also depict uh, points uh, on a map and uh, show the numerical value associated with those uh, points. Uh, you can have a dashboard environment to check multiple variables. Uh, it's kind of like what you would see in your in your in your car as you're driving. Uh, it shows all those indicators in a dashboard fashion, so you can quickly diagnose and identify problems. Uh, he, here's an example uh, of a screenshot from uh, the alarm system. You can uh, drop in a lot of uh, equations to control those uh, alarms in the software. And then ultimately, um, we'll uh, make the data that's processed by the uh, Contrail software available to uh, the public in a form similar to what you're seeing over here. This is an example from Harris uh, flood control district uh, that shows uh, what it looked like during Hurricane Harvey. And you can see that the tremendous amount of um, high water events uh, that were recorded uh, during Hurricane Harvey. So what are the remaining tasks uh, for the software uh, installation and deployment? Uh, so you can uh, see it on your end. So as I mentioned, uh, it'll go to council date uh, November 14th. And then once the council approves it, uh, we'll, be, be, we'll uh, execute the contract and then the installation can begin. Um, they'll migrate uh, the, um, the data that's uh, currently um, hosted in the current system into uh, the Contrail software. They'll integrate uh, the, um, the, uh, their components along with our components uh, through an integration process, um, through and that's a, a significant amount of effort. The integration, the, the, their folk uh, will um, have to come over here and 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 spend some time understanding our system and integrating their system in, in our system. And then uh, staff will be trained uh, on the use of software once uh, lots of the uh, issues have been ironed out. Um, and then the, uh, the data will get deployed uh, for us to test out and then eventually made public uh, sometime around a June timeframe. Um, so that, that's uh, the developments on the software. I'd like to move on to the flood response plan. Um, so the flood response plan is a, a planning level document uh, that will be undertaken as part of this project that will uh, describe um, the, um, the city's flood responses uh, depending on different types of threats, uh, flood threats uh, encountered, likely to be encountered by the city. And uh, these flood threat, uh, threats range from flash flooding through to dam, uh, potential dam breaches um, to regional uh, level flooding uh, due to uh, levee system issues uh, and riverine flooding. 
So since uh, we met in April, we've had a, a stakeholder meeting um, within the city to uh, identify what that uh, planning level document was going to look like. And uh, based off of the me meeting, as well as uh, gathering up a lot of the background material, and let me just describe what that background material is. So the this flood response plan is not uh, going to uh, um, create anything new in the sense that it's going to integrate uh, and bring in together in one document all the different types of emergency action plans, the emergency management plans uh, that are used uh, in the city by external agencies such as the uh, Corps of Engineers, the Water District. Um, we are not going to actually copy into this document all those documents. We'll just refer to those documents, but it's going to integrate in one place the different types of flood responses uh, associated with different threats in one place. So that's... Uh, what was uh, part of this background research was to gather lots of that material so that uh, it, we could understand what the different types of uh, emergency actions were. Obviously, when you respond to a dam breach, you're not going to respond the same way as you would do a flash flood uh, and so on. So the... the, um, the, the, the uh, the effort uh, led to creation of a conceptual framework, how to format that uh, the document. And um, the conceptual framework is uh, using the what's called the TDEM-10. Uh, this is a emergency uh, planning uh, frame format that the Texas Division of Emergency Management uses. So we will use that framework as much as relevant to uh, host the, this flood response plan. And we have developed a early draft of that. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing the draft. Uh, and uh, I'm working with, uh, with the consultants and the um, uh, emergency management folk to finalize that draft. And then um, once that draft is uh, complete, we will uh, undertake a tabletop uh, exercise. So uh, this outli outlines what I just discussed. Uh, I did not talk about the preparedness and recovery, but this uh, flood response plan will also have uh, mention of preparedness and recovery, but the main focus is on response. So here's the uh, TDEM uh, format uh, that will be used uh, to write out this uh, flood response plan. What I'd like to mainly highlight here are Section 4 called Situation and Assumption, uh, which deal with, uh, with uh, stating the facts on the ground. And then concept of operations it deals with uh, the different uh, efforts that are undertaken by different uh, by, by the different types of threats. So, and so that will describe the, uh, the, the, the resources uh, available as well as the application of those resources. And then direction as control, and direction and control deals with how the, um, the level of flood threat gets escalated as the threat level gets uh, worse and worse. Uh, the preparedness level uh, part of the document will uh, consist of these uh, components that I've uh, listed out here, primarily dealing with educational efforts to keep the public informed uh, prior to uh, severe events. Uh, there's a significant amount of inspections and monitoring, uh, particularly with the regional dams. Um, and then... Um, Mention will be made of the uh, the high water warning system uh, that's used to um, warn the drivers uh, of uh, flood at the hazardous crossings. So uh, let me step through some of what I talked about in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the response itself is going to focus on 
uh, the uh, the hazards caused by um, uh, potential dam breaches uh, of city dams um, and the, the regional dams. So there, there have been over the years emergency management plans already developed for these. So there's going to be, as I mentioned, nothing new in this document. It just integrates the existing emergency management plans that are already out there. Uh, the second uh, type of tra uh, flood hazard that will be discussed will be the, the flash flooding due to overflowing creeks as well as uh, undersized storm drains. And the third type of uh, flood threat uh, that this document will deal with is the riverine uh, flooding associated with the Trinity River. Here's a map showing you these uh, dams. There are eight city-owned dams uh, uh, in the city, um, as well as the regional dams, which are Eagle Mountain, um, Lake Worth, and then Lake Benbrook. Uh, the Eagle Mountain uh, is uh, managed and operated by the Tarrant Regional Water District, Lake Benbrook, uh, the Corps of Engineers, and then the city of Fort Worth uh, is responsible for Lake Worth. Here's uh, the different types of flood hazards that uh, have been identified and the map, map on the left side shows you the mapping of the floodplains uh, as well as the repetitive loss uh, and uh, flooding from um, areas that experience flooding due to undersized storm drains. And on the right side, I've showed you a typical um, type of map that's generated during a flood event uh, showing you areas that... Uh, that experience uh, overtopping as well as uh, incidences associated with those flood events during a flash flood event. So this, uh, the, the flood hazard that will be discussed will be the uh, flood hazards due to the Trinity uh, levees. Uh, and this map shows you the areas that are protected by the levees. So, um, so the f first important component will be uh, identification of the hazards. The second important component of this plan is identifying resources available to address each one of those threats. And that's what you see over here, the different types of uh, resources that are available for, to identify, uh, to work and address these uh, types of threats uh, for the flooding. And uh, the, uh, the um, early ones that dealt with uh, the um, flash floods, in this case, these, these are the types of uh, resources available uh, for uh, issues associated with, uh, with the potential uh, breach of the city dams. So the parks and stormwater have different uh, dams that they're responsible for monitoring uh, and inspecting. And if there are issue, issues associated with those, those will be uh, uh, immediately uh, forwarded, to, no, forwarded to the Office of Emergency Management and the Emergency uh, Management Coordinator on duty at that time. And then um, the Emergency Management Coordinator will um, bring in the police and fire to uh, provide notification to the homes and uh, prepare and execute uh, evacuation plans. Uh, there'll be um, coordination with uh, other agencies, uh, such as the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety um, uh, as part of this, this um, resource um, uh, notification. So in terms of flash flood, uh, the third important uh, component is the application of resources to address different types of uh, threats. In this case, I have uh, laid out uh, the, the main points uh, of, of how the city applies the resources to deal with flash floods. So the flash floods themselves can range, uh, dep depending on level of se severity, from level four, which is the least severe, to level one, uh, which is the most severe. And um, 
the level of activity of the field personnel uh, dictates a lot of um, the, 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 the escalation. Uh, and, and not only that, but also the, uh, the, the amount of rescues, the 911 calls, and all of that is coordinated and assessed uh, at the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, and so um, the, there's a lot of local uh, level activities um, that get coordinated at a high level uh, by the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, in terms of uh, monitor uh, application of resources uh, uh, for city dams, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, there's uh, monitoring um, uh, that that uh, initiates uh, the, the 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 distress uh, call to uh, other um, level. Um, Levels within the uh, city office of uh, levels of uh, emergency management. Uh, here's what it might look like uh, for the regional dams. Uh, again, uh, the monitoring and observation is, is is the point at which the notification uh, and the the escalations begin, uh, and then the. Um, the Corps of Engineers uh, alerts relevant folk at the various level of uh, uh, government, ranging from state to federal levels, and brings in the appropriate resources to address uh, uh, different levels of uh, severity uh, of uh, the dam breach. Um, so once there is a severe event, you also have to recover. Um, and uh, I have uh, shown some of the main points of the recovery. Uh, the debris is a significant part of uh, recovery. So there are debris removal processes in place. Um, the uh, Stormwater Management Division uh, does flood forensics to understand what happened and and try to uh, characterizes the uh, the storm and the flooding uh, extent, and then uh, city forces get uh, engaged um, to uh, to re repair uh, significant uh, damage to infrastructure, and then if a presidential declaration is made, uh, you also have to go through a cost recovery to recover the the costs. So here are the uh, remaining tasks. Um, so we'll uh, f anticipate finishing the uh, the draft of the flood response plan uh, by end of this year. Uh, it'll be put out for public comment. And then uh, the, the plan will go through a tabletop exercise. Uh, it'll be uh, updated based on the lessons learned from the tabletop exercise. And then uh, that document will be submitted to the Water Development Board and Texas Division of Emergency Management. And then following uh, their comments, the, uh, the flood response plan will get finalized uh, and go through um, an approval process with the, uh, with the Texas Division uh, and the Texas Water Development Board. We anticipate uh, completing um, all of this uh, by June of next year. So uh, I have reached the end of my uh, presentation. Um, and I wanted to summarize where we are right now. Um, we have a good understanding of the current high water warning system, uh, the issues associated with that uh, high water warning system. We've resolved some of the communication problems uh, by uh, by uh, by resolving the squelch noise issue at the transceiver, which has helped with the uh, the data collision uh, problem. Uh, of course, the data collision problem doesn't go away when you're using the alert, but we try to minimize uh, that as much as possible with our current system. And then we have uh, laid out uh, good plans to expand our network and move on to the Alert 2 uh, based uh, um, network. So we'll be working with a hybrid Alert Alert 2 network for a while and then eventually move on to a purely Alert 2 uh, based network. Uh, 
uh, as soon as uh, our bids for the equipment uh, and installation are complete, we'll begin installing the uh, dedicated weather station starting in January. The software s installations should begin soon in November, and then uh, it should lead all the way to uh, a, a public website sometime in the June-July uh, time frame next year. We'll uh, have a completed a draft flood response plan by end of this year, then which will go through those uh, phases that I showed you uh, just a little while ago, and uh, it'll get uh, sent to the appropriate uh, state agencies for the approval. And then I uh, plan on hosting a third public meeting uh, in June, uh, July timeframe in 2018. And uh, we will have uh, all the components as part of this Water Development Board grant um, by the um, extension period in September 2018. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd encourage you to send me email um, and uh, please visit the uh, website for updates and uh, keep up with the uh, city calendar for the uh, third and final public meeting. Thank you.